This is Histories and Mysteries. I'm Ashley. And I'm Jessica. And on this week's episode, Ashley is going to be talking about the story of Joyce Yost. And I am going to be addressing the story of Stonewall. Ooh, I honestly don't know much about Stonewall. I'm a, I'm a horrible historian person here. I'm not a historian at all, so I don't know why I said that. <laughs> <laughs> honestly, I didn't. It wasn't what I expected it to be. Okay. Um, I've always heard the phrase about it, especially during Pride Month, but I've never, uh, it wasn't what I thought it was going to be. So. Okay. Interesting. It's a shorty, but I think it's really important. Okay. Um, our episode will come out on the 26th and Stonewall occurred on the 27th. So oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I thought that it was like a really good time to do it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm super interested. And we do want to address that if you have been to our Facebook or Instagram page, you've probably noticed that Rochelle left you all a little love letter. Um, she is no longer going to be a co-host with us on Histories and Mysteries. We didn't have a falling out. Don't worry. We all still love each other. <laughs> if you listen here, you know that she works for the Haunted Walk and she's been doing a lot of stuff with them. Um, she got promoted and all that fun stuff. And then she's been doing a lot of stuff in local theater. So she's just really doesn't have the time to put into a podcast right now because it's a lot of work and it takes up a lot of time. Um, so she decided to lovingly back out um, of the podcast, but, you know, she's welcome anytime. So maybe in the future you'll hear a story or two from Michelle, uh, but we wish her the best of luck and uh, hope that everything goes really well for her. Yeah. Yeah. So just want to address that in case everybody's like, where'd Rochelle go? Well, that's <laughs> where. <laughs> so I am going to do the story of Joyce Yost. And I actually got this because um, there's this podcast I really like called Cold. And they're like an investigative podcast. It's one host. Um, and he's an investigative journalist. And so he goes out and investigates these different cases. And um, he actually was the one, the first season is on Susan Powell, who I did at the beginning of this podcast um, that is just a fascinating case to me. Well, season two of this podcast is about Joyce Yost. And um, it is a really fascinating case, um, a really sad case. So this is obviously going to be just like a, a brief introduction of the case, but I really highly recommend the podcast cold. If you want to hear a really in-depth um, it's a, it's a, it's a season long. They do the same story for the whole season. So it's got like, I want to say there's like nine episodes. Each are like an hour long of just this case. So obviously there's a lot cool. that I had to like skim out, but mm -hmm. yeah. And we'll put the link to the podcast as well in our episode yeah, notes. for sure. Yeah. It's really awesome. He does a really good job. It's one of those where it's just him, but he like interviews people and you'll hear like audio recordings and that kind of stuff. So that's cool. I like that. Yeah. So anyway, so I got obviously my information from cold and KSL and I think KSL is where he works. And so there's a lot of articles. And actually, if you Google Joyce Yost, like the only articles that come up are from KSL. So <laughs> I use a lot of those yes. articles. <laughs> <laughs> All right. As to uh, Joyce was born on <laughs> January 3rd, 1946 <laughs> in Bemidji, Minnesota to Holda and George Fiegel. She was the baby of the family by almost 18 years. So her two older siblings, Dorothy and Edna, were about 18 and 19 years older than her. So quite a bit older than her. Oh. Yeah, they don't say, like, why, but, you know, maybe she's, like, an oops baby, but. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like, in Downton Abbey when they, like, Cora got pregnant? Yeah, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Um, so as Joyce grew, she became a bit of a fashionista. Ooh. Her first boyfriend slash husband because they end up getting married mel said quote she was always dressed to the nines and hair was always impeccable Aww. and she did i mean she looked she always looked really good like she had a great body she had like her hair done and her makeup done she was always dressed really nice like she was a looker mm -hmm. and she met her first husband mel when she was still only in junior high school aka Aww. middle school uh but he was about three years older than her 
Yeah, but this was like back in the 40s. So I don't, well, I guess it'd be like the 50s. So I don't know if it was like that big of a deal. I don't know. But anyway, <laughs> they dated for a long time and even continued to date uh, after Mel graduated and enrolled in college. But his first year there, Joyce came to him with some big news. Uh oh. She was pregnant. Oh, no. Yeah, this wasn't good back then. This was the 50s. So, um, well, I guess this would be in the 60s now. Um, So like the early, early 60s. And they weren't married and her family was like a devout Lutheran family. So this was kind of like Uh shameful. Yeah. So her Lutheran mother told her that she was going to go to a Lutheran home um, until she gave birth. And then she was going to give the baby up for adoption, which was pretty common back then they kind of like sequestered young pregnant girls so that no one would know that they were pregnant um and then once they had the baby they'd go back home and just be like oh she was like you know visiting a cousin or whatever yeah well mel didn't like that idea and he said hey why don't we get married instead he said i'll drop out of school and i'll get a job And Joyce liked that idea much better. So um, in January of 1962, Mel and Joyce got married. Joyce was 16 at the time. And then (laughs) Mel was around 18, depending on like when his birthday was. Yeah, 18, 19. Yeah, yeah. So afterwards, Mel started looking for a job, but no one wanted to hire an 18-year-old college dropout with no experience. Um, And he finally went to a metal stamping company and the manager said, do you have a girl pregnant? <laughs> <laughs> and Mel said, come to find out his son was in the same circumstance. And that's why he thinks that that was the only reason he hired him because he felt bad for him because his son was, you know, the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> that's so funny. <laughs> I know. Oh, so um, after they got the job and they got married, uh, Joyce gave birth to their first child, Kim, and the new little family moved to Minneapolis, Minnesota. And the following year in June, the family welcomed a little boy named Greg. That was quick. Girl was only not pregnant for three months. <laughs> Cheapers. <laughs> But unfortunately, their marriage could not stand the test of time. They were so young when they got married and eventually they did divorce. Oh, yeah. But they did remain in each other's lives. They were very cordial with each other. Um, You know, they talked on the phone still and that kind of stuff. But after um, they divorced and since Mel was the breadwinner, Joyce really struggled. Uh, Her two sisters had moved out of Minnesota already. And then in 1968, Mel was drafted and deployed to the Vietnam War. Oh, no. He lives. Oh, good. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) But because of this, Joyce had no reason to stay in Minnesota, and she was struggling so much. So she decided to pack up the kids, and she moved to Utah, where her sister Dorothy now lived. Joyce lived with Dorothy for a while before finding her own place. And during this time, they became very, very close. Uh, The children said they have very fond memories of the two of them, like together and laughing and um, just having a good time. And not long after her move to Utah, Joyce met George Yost and the two married. But again, like three years later, they divorced. But she kept his last name. Yeah, she did. Um, through most of the children's lives, Joyce was working two or three jobs to make sure that she had enough money to support them. And eventually she landed a job selling cosmetics at the AZMI department store. Ooh. And this kind of made her a community figure because I think this was like the department store. And so people kind of knew her from that now. Mm-hmm. And this is how she lived out the next several years of her life. Um, her kids obviously grew up. They moved out. Her youngest, Greg, actually moved back in with her for a few years while he was in college. And then he got accepted into dental school. And so he moved out and out of um, state to go to dental school. So at this point, (laughs) this is crazy because Joyce, because she had her kids so young, they had moved out and like were in college and stuff like that. And she's only 39 now. Jeez. Yeah. So she still enjoyed a very pretty, a pretty active social life. 
Um, she was single. Her kids were moved out. Like she's 39, you know, she was having a good time. And yeah, one night she was out at pier three, which is what they call a supper club. And I had to Google that because I didn't know what that was. Do you know what that is, Jessica? Is it not just a restaurant? <laughs> so it's kind of like a restaurant slash like Ambling? social club. Okay. So like they have dancing and stuff, but like it's like a sit down restaurant too. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. But she was there. She was dancing, having a good time. And then around 10, 15, she decided to head home, which... I was like, dang, Joyce, that's late. I'm 35 and I'm oh, tired at 10. I was going to say that's <laughs> early. <laughs> I'm tired at 10. It's too okay. late for me. Right now, I am currently always tired by like eight or nine. Yeah. But like, <laughs> if you're going to party, party that's harder. <laughs> that's true. That's true. Yeah. That's usually when can't... we would get to the club. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. When I was younger, for sure. Yeah. For sure. But I'm 35 now. I'm an old lady. I'm not. <laughs> When I was camping with my parents, I stayed up to like, they stay up late. And so mm. they, I would like play cards with them and stuff. And I was up to like 10, 30, 11. I was like, you kids are keeping me up too late. <laughs> <laughs> I could not do that. <laughs> no. We well, like, my son gets up at six. So, well, that's the problem, right? Yeah. Like they get up so freaking early. <laughs> yeah. I was, I was telling my doctor, he was like, yeah, he usually gets up at six. She goes, oh, he's an early riser. And I was like, yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> All right. So this is where it gets bad. Okay. I'm ready. Sort (laughs) of. Yeah. So after she left the supper club, uh, Joyce pulled up, she lived in an apartment and she had a carport. And so she pulled up into her carport and noticed that a small red Mazda coupe had pulled up behind or beside her and stopped. Before she could even open her door, a man from the Mazda had walked up and opened her door for her. Ew. He then wedged his body between Joyce and the door so she couldn't close it. (gasps) How terrifying. Terrifying. He said, I can't believe I'm doing this, but I noticed you at Pier 3 and I was attracted to you and decided to follow you. You know, totally normal behavior. Ew. And Joyce was terrified, but she kept her cool. You know, she said, um, Joyce had said of the incident, I wasn't just with somebody that was being a little bit forceful that I was going to be able to get rid of. (sighs) So I I feel like, yeah. And at that point, like, you know, what kind of guy this is and you know that you can't hurt his pride. Well, I just think it's funny that it's like, I can't believe I'm doing that. I know. I know. <laughs> Wait till what he says later. Oh, man. So, okay. again, she knew that if she turned him down flat, it would hurt his pride. He would get angry and she didn't want to make him angry. You know, she was in such a vulnerable position. So he asked her to get a drink and she said she was tired, but maybe they could get coffee another time and set instead because she, again, didn't want to make him mad. Mm-hmm. But this didn't sit well with Dave. I'm using air quotes because that's not his real name, but that's the name he gave her. Okay. And he got pissed. He grabbed her by the throat and said if she screamed or said anything, he would tear her throat open. He shoved her down in her car and he raped her. Oh. She tried to fight back, scratching him, hitting him. Um, she even broke some of his her acrylic nails on him in the process. <gasps> oh. And at one point she, um, got found her keys on the ground and she went to stab him in the eye. But right when she was about to get him in the eye, he saw and like turned his face <gasps> and she did gouge him in the face, but she didn't yeah. get him in the eye. So, Ugh, that sucks. um, yeah. And so at that point he said, I have a gun, stop fighting me. So she did. <laughs> And she said at this point, her only goal was to stay alive. So she cooperated with him. And it was really sad because in a couple of the interviews, she comes back saying that she was afraid that because she cooperated, that meant to him that she was okay with it and he wouldn't get like convicted of rape. Mm -hmm. Um, Then by her neck, he dragged her to his car, shoved her in the passenger seat upside down so that her head was on the floorboard and her feet were like kind of up in the air 
And she actually lost an earring in his car during the struggle, which will come back to haunt him. Oh, good. He, while he's driving her to his house, he's saying, I'm not this type of guy. I'm usually the type of guy that buys flowers for a girl. Yeah, okay. Right? Yeah, okay. I'm sure that that's the type of guy you are. Right. So he drove her to his house. Okay. Blindfolded her. Took her to his bedroom where he raped her repeatedly and in several different ways. Joyce was smart, though, and she was talking to him and trying to engage him in conversation to, like, relate to him so that he wouldn't kill her. And it worked. He (sighs) began to trust her, and eventually he said he would take her home. She asked for something to wear because, like, her her, he ripped her dress. Mm -hmm. And he gave her one of his blue shirts, and then he drove her home. And he dropped her off. Whoa. Once she was in her house and had the doors locked, she broke down crying. She called her sister Dorothy, not knowing what to do. And Dorothy told her to call the police, but she was scared. Mm-hmm. Dorothy said, if you don't call the police, Joyce, I will. So Joyce decided to make the phone call and the police showed up, took her report. They then told her that she needed to take her hospital to a rape kit. And she agreed. And this is weird to me, but... Okay. They had her get in the police car and drive back to where, like, on the way home, he didn't blindfold her. So she saw the, like, route. And they had her drive the route back and then, like, go through the neighborhood until she saw the house. And she's like, that's the house and that's the car. Mm. Isn't that kind of weird? Yeah, it's a little dangerous. Yeah. And pretty traumatizing, I feel. Yeah. I, like, yeah. I mean, if they wanted to know where i feel like you should have driven around and not a police car yeah but, but still like it's pretty awful to do yeah. that to her yeah but because she was able to point out the car and they could call the plane in they did get a name doug lovell oh doug yeah he's not a good guy no so at the hospital the detective bill showed up to listen to Joyce's story and get any information he could from it. And we love Bill. Bill was great. Okay, wonderful. Yes. Go, Bill. He was. We love Bill. Woohoo! Um, the rape vi- victim advocate was also there, and she said she was incredibly impressed with how Bill handled the interview and how kind he was to Joyce and how Aww. he was, like, giving Joyce the power back by saying, like, you know, you tell me what you can, you know, we'll take it your pace. And he was just really, really good. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. After the interview in the hospital, Bill went to Joyce's house and saw her car door was still open and found the broken nail fragments um, in her car. He also found the keys that she had used to stab Doug's face. Um, (laughs) And so it all like corroborated her story, right? Mm -hmm. And so once they had all their ducks in a row, it was time for the police to go pick up Doug. They saw him driving down the road, pulled him over. Sure enough, he had a scratch down the side of his face and they found Joyce's earring on the floorboard. So oh, good. Yes. More evidence. So he was arrested. Well, of course, Doug lied and said it was all mutual. He said they had met at the club and Joyce asked him to go back to the his her place with him and blah, 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 blah. Bullshit, bullshit, bullshit. And this also wasn't Doug's first run in with the law. He had previously been in juvenile court for theft and burglary. And later as a teen, he was ordered to the Utah State Industrial School for a 90-day assessment. They were hoping they could steer him away from crime since at this point he was only a teen. Um, But it didn't. (laughs) Clearly. (laughs) Yeah. And as an adult, he served time for possession of a controlled substance, theft in two different counties at the same time, which both judges gave him probation for. Of course. And then he um, got caught for armed robbery. But in the armed robbery, he was just the getaway driver. So the judge once again did not give him prison time. Oh, my goodness. He instead put him in a public offenders program and at the state Utah at the Utah State Hospital. But Doug wouldn't abide by the rules. So he ended up going to jail anyway. Mm -hmm. This is the type of person that we're dealing with. The one that never does stuff like that. Right. And, of course, he didn't serve long because he was a model inmate and won the board over and was granted parole. Super. Yeah. 
So by the time he was in front of a judge for the rape of Joyce, he had quite a rap sheet. And even though Joyce had testified that Doug said he would kill her if she reported the rape, the judge set his bail for a measly $25,000 and Doug was out. Super. The judge also scheduled their preliminary hearing for June 12th, 1985, and poor Joyce would have to testify, and she was scared. No kidding. But while Doug was out on bail, he was wheeling and dealing. He did not want to go back to prison, and he decided that the most logical thing to do would be to kill the only witness to his crime, Joyce. But not only was Doug a coward, He knew that the police would be able to trace the murder back to him easily if he did it. So he called an old prison buddy by the name of William, a.k.a. Billy Jack Wiswell, and said, hey, I need your help with a job, but I'm too scared to do it myself because I'm a big wuss who never takes responsibility for my own actions. (laughs) Just kidding. He didn't say that, but he did say I need your help. (laughs) Oh, my God. Okay. (laughs) He told Billy that he needed Joyce killed. And he would pay him $5,000 after he did it to kill her. Wow. Okay. Which to me doesn't seem like a lot to kill someone. Mm-hmm. And I, just- I feel like in the 80s, it might have been a bit. Well, adjusted for inflation, it is $13,500. Oh, yeah. That doesn't seem like It just enough. doesn't seem like a lot to kill someone. But no. Billy agreed. And they decided the best way to handle this was to steal guns. So they drove up a random dirt road and watched some farmhouses. One house was dark even at night, so they assumed it wasn't inhabited at the time. They broke in, got lucky. There was a ton of rifles and shotguns for the taking, and they took a whole bunch of them and left. Super. Yeah. And obviously one of these guns they were going to use to shoot Joyce. So in May of 1985, uh, Billy Jack headed out on foot from Doug and his wife Rhonda's apartment. Yes, Doug was married at the time. Um, with the gun to Joyce's house. Thankfully, she wasn't there. Um, but he decided to hide in some bushes across the street and wait. And as he was, kind of a miracle happened. He decided that he couldn't go through with it. He couldn't murder a woman he didn't know. So he buried the gun and skipped town. Oh, jeez. But this didn't deter Doug, and he turned to another friend to kill Joyce. How many friends does one guy have to kill people? Well, when you're in prison. Yeah, so true. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so Doug reached out to Tom Peters and offered him $800 as a down payment. And Tom said he would do it, but he said he actually had no intention of actually committing the murder. He was addicted to drugs at the time, and he said he just wanted money to get more drugs. So his plan was actually to use half of the money to buy drugs, then go to Vegas, double the money and give it back to to Doug saying, I can't do it. (laughs) Oh my God. Okay. Good plan. Solid plan. Love it. Solid. Solid. (laughs) Obviously Vegas didn't work out. Obviously. (laughs) And, uh, he was like, Oh, sorry, dude. I spent all your money and I'm not going to do it. (laughs) Okay. So Doug realized if he wanted Joyce gone then uh, he's going to have to do it himself. All of this time had passed and it was finally time for the preliminary hearing. Poor Joyce had to go on the stand and relive her trauma. And she was really embarrassed by some of the aspects of the rape that she refused to admit they happened in court. Even though she had said what had happened in her first interview um, at that hospital, when the prosecutor asked her about it, she wouldn't she wouldn't say it. And so because she wouldn't testify to all aspects, the judge dismissed the sodomy count, but the other counts against Doug were to move forward to trial. What other counts? Um, he was charged with, I think it was rape and sexual assault or, Oh no, it was, it was rape and kidnapping. Okay. Sorry. I should have written that down. Um, so unfortunately, during this time between the preliminary hearing and the arraignment, Doug was still out on bail. 
one night he had gone up to mountain reservoir and had uh some drinky drinks <laughs> and went boating and then decided to drive back because he's an asshole and on his way back he ran into a parked flatbed in an apartment building and then just kept on going oh my gosh so the police pulled him over for a dui and noticed that he had a loaded gun in his car with six rounds in the clip and one in the chamber and he was on the road that led to Joyce's apartment. Oh. Since he was out on probation, he was not allowed to have guns, let alone be driving drunk. Yeah. But he was pulled over in different city limits. And at the time, these cities didn't really talk to each other much because they were still using paper. There wasn't like a central database. So they had no idea that Doug was out on bond for the rape of a woman who lived on that street. Um, he was thankfully arrested, but since they didn't know what was going on, they didn't know it was like a bigger deal because that's where Joyce lived. He was again, released on bond. Mm, okay. Yep. So at his arraignment, Doug pleaded not guilty to the rape charges and the judge placed a hold order on Doug and literally wrote in there this, the defendant was ordered held until further notice of this court. Well, turns out that Doug's little Mazda had some stolen parts and police officers from another county drove up from Salt Lake City to arrest Doug for these charges. Oh, no. And they brought him back to their jail. And since their jailers didn't know he was supposed to be held, they let him go at 1.45 a.m. on July 9th to wait for the trial for this case. Oh, my God. Yeah. Okay. This is stressing me out. I know. And soon after, Joyce disappeared she did yeah when detectives went to her apartment they found a bloody washcloth in her room and they took the sheets from her bed in case there was evidence on them but they didn't really see anything from the naked eye they also found her car a few days later near a water tank in the foothills of the mountains but her body was nowhere to be found Mm -hmm. weeks later when her kids were cleaning out her apartment because their um apartment Landlord said, hey, you either have to move her stuff or you have to continue to pay. And like they didn't have the money for an extra apartment. Um, And when they were moving the mattress, they noticed on the underside of the mattress was a huge blood stain. Oh, cool. So they called the police and one officer said that that's too much blood for someone to still be alive. But this was still not enough evidence to declare Joyce dead. And so for her rape trial, the prosecution decided to move forward with it still. And he just said that she was like missing or gone, but he couldn't say that like she was murdered because they didn't have any proof. Doug, of course, had an alibi for the night that she was last seen. So the investigation into her disappearance continued while the trial for her rape was going on. It was making me angry. Yeah. It'll, this whole story will make you enraged. Okay. So during trial, since Joyce was not able to testify, the court allowed her allowed her preliminary hearing testimony to be read to the jury, and it was powerful. The jur- jury deliberated for only an hour and found him guilty. Oh, good. As he was being escorted out of the courthouse, Joyce's son-in-law said that Doug had a smirk on his face. So the son-in-law, his name is Randy, said, you motherfucker. Doug just looked at him in the eye and said, She's gone, buddy. She's gone. You'll never find her. Mm, Cool. Yep. So Doug was sentenced to five to life with a 15 year minimum. He, of course, appealed and his attorney hoped that they would win by calling it a garden variety rape. The fuck does that mean? Right. So during this time, the investigation as to Joyce's whereabouts was underway. Unfortunately, they didn't have much to go on. They searched the area where her car was. Um, They did get two tips, none of which led anywhere. So five years into this investigation, Detective Terry decided to try again with Doug's wife, Rhonda, who had previously said Doug had nothing to do with Joyce's disappearance. Of course, because he's never done anything to you. Right. And Terry kind of spooked Rhonda. He said that he thought... She knew more about this than she was saying, and that as long as she hadn't pulled the trigger herself, they could help her. And I think after five years of dealing with this and it weighing on her conscience, um, 
and, you know, being out of Doug's grasp at this point, Mm -hmm. she finally broke and she said, oh, he didn't shoot her. He just stomped on her throat. (gasps) Oh my God. Yeah. And then she broke down in tears and Terry assured her that they could help her if she would help them. So after this, Rhonda spilled her guts. She said that on August 10th, 1985, she had driven Doug to Joyce's house and dropped him off where sometime between or dropped him off sometime between 11 p.m. and 1 a.m. She knew that she was dropping him off so that he could kill Joyce. She also said that Doug had cased Joyce's house a few weeks prior and learned that one of her windows didn't latch. So he planned to wait until she was asleep and then go through that window. After Holy Rhonda. crap. Yeah. After Rhonda had dropped Doug off, she went home and went to sleep. She said the next morning around 5 a.m., she received a phone call from Doug and he told her to meet him in the Wilshire Theater in South Ogden. When she got there, she saw that he was driving Joyce's car. He drove her car to the place where the police found it and Rhonda was behind him. He threw the keys down the hill and they left. Police knew she was telling the truth because when they went to that area, they found the keys right where she said they would be. Rhonda. Rhonda. Uh, Rhonda, and this is a quote from the cold podcast said, Rhonda told Terry that Doug had described to her how he'd startled Joyce awake when he'd entered her apartment. He'd been holding a knife and in the ensuing struggle, he slashed Joyce's fingers. The wound had blood causing blood stains on Joyce's mattress. Doug had told Rhonda he bandaged Joyce's hand, mopped up the blood with a washcloth and stripped the bed sheets, flipped the mattress and remade the bed. Then Rhonda said Doug had told her he'd taken Joyce out to her car driven her to someplace up by the Cossey, walked her from the road up a hill into a patch of trees and strangled her to unconsciousness. Then to make sure Joyce was dead, Doug had reportedly told Rhonda he'd stomped on Joyce's throat. She (sighs) said, I wasn't there. That's just what Doug told me. But Terry, who was a detective on the disappearance of her, um, had seen the bloodstain mattress and he said that it was more likely Joyce had died in the apartment just by how much blood there was. But he do he did believe that that's what Doug had told Rhonda. So that's what she had believed. Yeah. Um, at this point, Rhonda had divorced Doug, but they were still in contact every day. He was trying to get her back, all this kind of stuff. So Terry asked Rhonda if she would allow them to record their conversations when he called her from prison and if she would wear a wire and go visit him. And she agreed. Okay. And she got him. He confessed to her on tape that he had murdered Joyce, which she already knew, but she like got him to say it on tape. Yeah. Doug, not knowing that she was recording him for the police was super cocky and basically said, (laughs) well, they can't do anything. They don't have a body. Oh, okay. (laughs) During this time, Doug had also lost his rape appeal, but was trying one more appeal um, at the federal level. Oh, okay. But in May of 1992, police were finally able to charge Doug with capital murder. Now, capital murder is worse. Well, not worse because murder is bad, but like capital. He got the capital murder charge because he not only murdered her, but it was also messing with a witness of the court because she was a witness in his trial which is a big no, no. And that can give you, um, that puts the death sentence on the table. Oh, so Doug's lawyers went right to work. First, they appealed to use, uh, the use of Rhonda's recording, but they lost that. Um, and because of that, they knew they were in trouble. Greg Roberts, the prosecuting attorney said that all of Joyce's, all Joyce kids wanted was Joyce's remains back. Um, And they would take death off the table if he would return Joyce's remains. So Doug's lawyer brought this deal to him and um, Doug said yes. And then the lawyer said to him, Doug, could you really locate the body given all the time that has passed? Doug said he could find it in the dark. In fact, he was willing to do it right that moment. John reminded him that it was the middle of winter. Doug told his attorney that it didn't matter. He'd be able to find Joyce's body even in a blinding snowstorm. Oh, it was all bullshit. (laughs) Okay. So police took Doug out to where he said her body was on his way. Doug became emotional. Of course he did. Well, I would have been. Yeah. And he said he was too agitated to go right to Joyce from Joyce's remains. Poor baby. Mm -hmm. 
so he asked if the police would first buy him a beer and they they did because they just they just wanted to find her like they just wanted to give the family closure so they're like fine whatever so they got him a beer and then he finally was like okay okay i'm ready i'm ready and he went to the spot and lo and behold he couldn't find her of course police searched and searched and searched for days they brought in dogs they searched everywhere and they couldn't find any traces of joyce they didn't even find her purse or jewelry that doug had claimed she had been buried with um and so had Rhonda. so they knew that her purse should have been there so the thought of like animals carrying off didn't really make sense because the purse was was not there either and animals have no use for a purse they wouldn't have carried that off yeah So death was back on the table and because of this plea agreement, Doug had pled guilty. So now a judge was going to sentence him. And in the beginning, he had a choice between a jury sentence and a judge sentence, but they went with a judge thinking that he'd be less likely to sentence him to death because this specific judge had never sentenced anyone to death before. (laughs) But they thought that a jury would sentence him to death because it's such a horrible case right Mm -hmm. uh doug wrote the judge a letter basically saying like hey don't kill me you know i can help others like you know and he ended the letter with a paragraph about his childhood achievements like championships in tennis motocross and wrestling that was your childhood dude right your adulthood has not been very nice (laughs) yeah His attorney tried to argue that he was a changed man by the proof that he took the police out several times, just trying to locate Joyce's body. But prosecution said, yeah, he just liked getting out of prison. Yeah. The judge came back and delayed, deliberated for several days. And he said, quote, in all my years on the bench, I've never given out the death sentence. His voice cracked. And he said, I sentence you to death. Good. Judge Taylor selected lethal injection. He scheduled a date, but in the next breath, he postponed it indefinitely because there's a, a Utah law that there's, if someone is sentenced to death, it has to go automatically through an appeal process. So detectives actually believe that he didn't lead them to Joyce's body because they think that there may have been other bodies he disposed of there. There were other missing women around the same time. Um, but that's like a whole nother story that we don't have time for in this podcast. But if you want to hear more <laughs> about it again, it's in gold. So after Doug had been given a death sentence, he was like, Oh um, wait, I don't want to plead guilty anymore. And you know, I want a jury trial instead of a judge trial. And he found some crazy small loophole to plead his case and basically wrote a letter to the judge saying that he went with a judge based on bad advice from his lawyer and wanted to fire his lawyer. And his request went through the system for nearly two decades. And here's how it like broke down. So it was the first appeal was that he had ineffective counseling, but the Utah Supreme court said, nah, and that took about six years. Then Doug filed a motion to withdraw his guilty plea. He said that his guilty plea had not been made knowingly because the judge didn't follow rule 11. So this is a quote straight from cold because I think it really explains rule 11 well. It just says that rule 11 is a portion of the Utah rules of criminal procedure that spells out the rights judges are supposed to communicate to defendants when they plead guilty. The text of rule 11 had changed a short time before Doug's August, 1993 sentencing hearing and judge Taylor had referred to the older outdated version in his conversation with Doug at the time of sentencing. Um, And so he said that because the judge read him the old one, he should be able to remove his plea. Oh my God. The judge said no, because his motion to change the plea didn't take place in this 30 day window mandated by law. So Doug once again appealed to the Utah Supreme Court saying that the 30 days should start from the sentencing, not from the day that he made his plea. And the Utah court said, yeah, okay, that this request was made within the window. So the judge had to look at it. So the judge looked at it and he also said, nah. So (laughs) like, seriously, why would his mind change? (laughs) So back Doug went to the Supreme Court 
And this time they did side with Doug. So basically his guilty plea was revoked. He got a whole new trial by jury and he pled not guilty. And Joyce's son-in-law, Randy said to get him to see him get another chance at starting this thing all over again. It kind of made me feel like, you know, like there's no justice here. This like guy keeps going on and going and getting what he wants when he knows he's already testified. He got up on stand. He told him exactly what he did. He ruined a lot of people's lives and here you're giving him another chance. It's just not fair. No, that doesn't seem right. No. And at this point it had been 17 years. Yeah. Like what do you like? Yeah. And 25 years had passed since he killed Joyce. Oh my God. And Randy said again, Doug Lovell's got, he's got more chances in life than Joyce ever did. Like, how is that even, how is, uh, yeah. Yeah. It keeps going. (sighs) So March, 2015, 30 years after the rape of Joyce Yost, Doug's new trial begins. Oh my freaking goodness. Okay. There's some law stuff here, like behind the scenes crap and it's stupid, but basically the jury could sentence him to three things, death, life without parole or life with parole. But because of these behind the scenes things and like when he was tried versus this trial and like when he was convicted, like just the, he got to take life without parole off the table. So he got to say, I don't want that to be an option. So the jury could decide between life with parole and death, which is risky because they either have to say, yes, you should be able to get out at some time or put him to death. Well, the jury found him guilty and once again, sentenced him to death. But again, they had to appeal according to the law and his lawyer also appealed for a whole new trial due to some bullshit things he believed the judge did wrong the judge (sighs) said nope so back (laughs) to the utah supreme court he went good so in his death penalty appeal one of the things he argued was that the original lawyer didn't call up all of his character witnesses that could have helped him prosecution then called these people up um in this supreme court case after telling them and like told them what Doug did and some of them kind of like recanted what they thought so basically saying like hey this was probably a strategy that his lawyers didn't call these people up not negligence like he probably didn't call them up because they weren't like super great they were kind of wishy-washy yeah but some of them stood their ground like this one lady from this charity called rising starch she basically said that like it didn't matter what his crime was. He was a changed person. So he should be able to have life with parole. And she was like going on saying like, he's changed person, da, da, da. And he's like, but you've only ever known him in prison. Have you ever yeah. seen him get rejected by a, a woman? How, do yeah. you know how he's going to react? So she's like, I just know who he is now. Okay. Oh, okay. Then a bunch of delays in his trial happened. Then COVID happened. So there was another delay. Jeez, it's still going. Holy shit. Yeah. Ah. Then finally, in February of 2020, the judge said, hey, no, you didn't have defective counsel. So now that that decision has been made, the case goes back to the Utah Supreme Court to see if the death verdict will still stand. And this is still in process now. Holy shit. The detective said that he's like, you got to realize that there's still 20 some years left of appeals he can do. So he will probably never get executed, but he probably also won't ever get out of jail unless they, the Supreme court says that the death verdict doesn't stand. Then he gets a whole new trial again. Oh my freaking goodness. Unfortunately, police are still looking for Joyce Yost remains and to this day have not been able to locate them. What? Yeah. Holy guacamole. Okay. Yeah. So that, my friends, is the story of Joyce Yost. It was 
infuriating. Awful. <laughs> and infuriating. Yes. Yes, it was. Like you should have seen my face the whole time. <laughs> it is infuriating. But again, cold is really, really good. It's a great like case to listen to. So definitely go check it out if you have time. Oh my God. Oh, that made me really mad. <laughs> I did not like that, but you did a really good job. So thank you. Thanks. You're welcome. Just like uh, the whole court process confuses me sometimes. Like, yeah, yeah. Why would you sentence somebody to death and then it go through like all this rigmarole, you know, mm-hmm. like sentence them to death. They die the next day. What is the point? <laughs> Yeah. I mean, I'm definitely against the death penalty, but I get what you're saying. If you're going to have the death penalty. Yeah, that's the thing. Like, if you're going to have it, follow through with it. I think they just want to make sure that, like, with y'all, all the appeals and everything, that it's like, it's this guy really did it. Like, he really deserves, you know. Yeah, but he's tying up the system. And obviously, like, yeah. you know, he did it. Yeah. So, like, yeah. oh, my God. Okay, well, thanks. I hated it. You're welcome. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Is yours pretty awful too? Yes and no. Okay, well, I'm excited. Okay, so like, yeah, it's kind of like good and bad. Okay. It's good for kind of like what it did for the LGBTQ plus community. Mm-hmm. And just to preface, it was just the LGBTQ at the time. So that's how I'm going to be referencing it. Gotcha. Because it was back in like, where was it? The 70s or 80s? Okay. I think. I don't know. I don't know. We'll figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> um, like I said, it's a short one, but I figured it was kind of important to talk about in this month. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if it's been like fully discussed on here, but I am like part of the group. So I'm not just like telling this story just for the sake of telling the story, because I know other podcasts tried to tell the story and then they got like a, a crap ton of backlash oh, from really? everybody because they weren't part of the community and they were just kind of like doing it for like to get things out there. But gotcha. Yeah. So just kind of want to make that clear. <laughs> I'm not doing that for that. <laughs> so Stonewall was called the Stonewall Inn. And it was kind of what you might call a hole in the wall. <laughs> it was a bar that couldn't legally sell alcohol. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> the alcohol was actually bootlegged. And the alcohol that did manage to come in was really watered down. Oh. And the labels on the bottles didn't match the contents that were inside the bottles. (laughs) So you never know what you were going to get. Yeah, pretty much. (laughs) And there were no fire exits and there was no running water. So a literal hole in the ground. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. The no fire exits. I feel like maybe I remember the story now. Yeah. Does that have anything to do with the fire? I don't know. <sighs> okay. Continue. <laughs> <laughs> Despite its flaws, it was the only place for New York's gay community to express themselves and to interact with others that were just like them. In 1969, It was illegal to show PDA with someone of the same gender and dressing in drag was most definitely heavily frowned upon. And all of this was as criminal as stealing and embezzling, and it could lead to charges, arrest, or beatings by the police. Oh my God. Like how horrible. Yeah. It is amazing to see how far everything has come since then yeah like it's quite amazing I know that like obviously there are still the struggles and still a long way to go but 
Yeah, but it, it is nice to see that it has come a little bit further than this. Yeah, yeah. In sure. some places, obviously. Right, yeah. Um. So since all this was still illegal at the time, the Genovese crime family wanted in. A literal crime family. <laughs> They're like, yes, this looks good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they became the financial backing for New York's underground gay scene. Their fundings included the 181 Club, the Howdy Club, and obviously the Stonewall Inn. And with the help from this family, the bars were able to avoid issues with the law. I want to say like, oh, that's pretty cool that they were like, you know, helping the community. But like at the same time, I know that's probably not why they did it. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Even with their protection, though, there were still issues that arose. The state was super keen on these laws being in place and how they were handled. So much so that they went undercover, offered a member of the LGBTQ community a drink, made some offers to them and then arrested those that accepted oh that's called entrapment now yeah isn't that awful yeah unfortunately the mafia didn't exactly have the means to pay off every single cop in the city especially not when things were escalating the way that they were over a hundred men were being arrested per week by the mid-1960s wow During this tumultuous time is when the raid took place on Stonewall Inn. This raid took place on the night of June 27th, 1969. It happened fast and it happened without warning. The police barreled in at 1.20 a.m., which super rude. People are having fun. Yeah. Then the bartender working that night was shocked. Because he didn't receive any information that it was going to be raided from any of their sources. Oh, gosh. Even to this day, it remains unclear why he wasn't tipped off. There are speculations that they were behind on payments to dirty cops or that the mafia enjoyed blackmail over selling alcohol. That, yeah, either of those. Yeah. In any event... The alcohol was out on display. All of the patrons were there, and it was a disaster. Everyone was ordered to line up with one another so that their identities could be confirmed. If someone had a different gender on their ID that didn't match their appearance, they would be arrested immediately. Oh, God. Those that had no identification on them were brought into another room to be identified This is a devastating blow for this establishment, and it was one of the few places even drag queens felt welcome. And where the underage to homeless LGBTQ community would go. And I am sure you can guess what happened next. I bet it's not good. Depends on which side you're on. (laughs) The drag queens begun... And they refused to go with the officers into the back to have their genders verified. Other patrons outright refused to show their IDs. It then escalated a little bit more. The police made the decision to just bring everyone in. But Marsha Johnson, a trans woman, shouted she had rights. And then she threw a shot glass into a nearby mirror. I'm not, I'm not gasping at what she did. I'm gasping at what is probably coming. Yeah. Outside of the Stonewall Inn, things were also starting to pick up. Many waited on news of their friends. Other members of the community joined them. They started taunting the police when the first batch of arrested parties came out. Stormy de Larverie, who was the Rosa Parks of the gay community, started fighting the officers. She was beat with clubs and thrown into a police vehicle. She shouted to the crowd, why don't you guys do something? So they did. Oh. Especially since they outnumbered the police. Okay. 
Yeah. They started throwing anything they could find, slashed tires, and used parking meters as battering rams. Amongst all of this, those that had been arrested managed to escape, and the officers ran to hide in the bar, which was then set on fire. There's your fire. (laughs) Well, this isn't the story I was thinking of, but that's also awful. Oh, (laughs) okay. (laughs) There's another bar fire that I was thinking of. Oh, geez. Okay. By 4 a.m., the bar that was once a safe haven was in ruins, and many had been hospitalized. Oh, apparently. It says to read screenshot. I think I took a picture of something. Oh. (laughs) So the officers ran into the building, and then the people set it on fire? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So Stonewall patron and protester Michael Fader explained the atmosphere, saying, quote, we all had a collective feeling that we'd had enough of this kind of shit. It wasn't anything tangible anybody said to anyone else. It was just kind of like everything over the years had come to a head on that one particular night in the one particular place, and it was not an organized demonstration. Everyone in the crowd felt that we were never going to go back. We weren't going to be walking meekly in the night and letting them shove us around. It's like standing your ground for the first time and in a really strong way. And that's what caught the police by surprise. There was something in the air, freedom, a long time overdue, and we're going to fight for it. It took different forms, but the bottom line was we weren't going to go away and we didn't, unquote. That's powerful. Isn't that awesome? Yeah. I love that. Stonewall, however, had become the symbol of resistance to social and political discrimination. Even though this riot didn't start the gay rights movement, it serves as a pivotal moment for a new generation. In 1999, the Stonewall Inn was put on the National Register of Historic Places, and in 2016, Obama designated a national monument for it. And in 2019, just before the 50th anniversary of the riots, New York City's police police commissioner, James P. O'Neill, issued an apology. He said, quote, the actions taken by the NYPD were wrong, plain and simple, unquote. And that's on Stonewall. I know it was like super short. No, I think it was a really important story. I I did not know that story. Um, I I mean, I had heard of Stonewall, but I didn't know, like, what it was. Yeah, they did a movie on it as well. Oh. um, Which is really cool. Yeah. But, yeah, so, I like like they said, like, it wasn't the, the moment that kind of started gay right movements, but at least it was, like, a moment in their history yeah yeah to get to where they wanted to go yeah so I thought that it was really cool and it seems like it was it was kind of a pivotal turning point yeah 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 I loved it thank you you're welcome do you got a joke for me I did and I didn't save it so I'm trying to see if I can find it oh here it is. <laughs> <laughs> what do you get when you cross an angry sheep and an angry cow an angry sheep and an angry cow dinner <laughs> <laughs> no you get two animals that are in a bad mood <laughs> <laughs> see and that's funny because i was trying to like combine the bond and the moo and i'm like i can't <laughs> I'm just going to picture them fighting and then they both die and then I have dinner. Oh, no. (laughs) I liked yours better. (laughs) Mine's less violent. (laughs) Oh, my God. Well, if you want more of us lovely ladies, you can find us on Facebook and Instagram. And if you'd like to rate and review us, you can do so on Spotify and Apple podcast. It would be really helpful so we can get out there a bit more. Yeah. And uh, that's, that's it. That's it. (laughs) (laughs) 
No more. No more. <laughs> well, we look forward to bringing you two new stories next week.